All right, so now we're continuing our examples of some bacterial diseases. So we'll give you a, first a, a background of bacteria. The earliest known forms of life were bacteria. In fact, they show up in the fossil record at 3.5 billion years old, approximately. And today they're found in very astronomical numbers. In fact, they've dominated the Earth in you know ever since they first evolved. There are approximately 10 million to 1 billion species. It's hard to determine how many species there are um, just because they are everywhere and it's hard to determine what constitutes one species to the next because they evolve very quickly similar to viruses. Alright, there are two domains to bacteria. Um, there's the eubacteria and the archaea bacteria, but we'll just call them bacteria and archaea. They all, all they all, they are all prokaryotic cells, which means they are single-celled, and they do not have a nuclear envelope. So they don't have a nucleus. They do have a chromosome, but they, uh, and the chromo chromosome is one circular strand. It's not necessarily circle-shaped, but it it goes you know, kind of like a string that's connected. Um, and they also have their own DNA, ribosomes, membranes, and plasmids, but they do not have organelles. So they don't have chloroplasts, they don't have um, endoplasmic reticulum, all the other ones. All they have are ribosomes, and they do have a cytoplasm as well. Um, bacteria have um, all forms of energy acquisition, but primarily they are heterotroph heterotrophs, meaning they eat other organisms. Um, many of them cause infections, so they'll eat tissues, or they will help decompose things, um, dead things, or they will also um, eat other bacteria. Some of them, however, are autotrophic, so we have an example here of some uh, photosynthetic bacteria. Um, there are also some that are chemoautotrophic, so they will use um, chemical reactions to power uh, something similar to photosynthesis. The reproduction is primarily through a um, process called binary fission. Okay, so this is not mitosis, uh, although it is somewhat similar. Um, but there's no lining up of the chromosomes because it only has one. And what happens is the DNA, DNA strand duplicates and then goes to opposite ends of the cells and then forms two new cells. There is no sexual reproduction. However, some genetic recombination events do occur uh, with the help of a structure called pili. So these are the pili which help kind of congregate two bacteria so they can exchange some genetic information. So the process of binary fission first starts by the duplication of the chromosome. You see have, you have that occurring here. And it can start on one end, one site, site of origin, and go in both directions. So you can see this one is going in both directions until it hits the site of termination, and then you have two full chromosomes. Um, once those chromosomes are made, they will go to the opposite ends of the cell as it um, may enlarge somewhat. And then the walls and cell membranes are formed in between the two um, chromosomes to form two new cells. Then they will separate and enlarge to their original size. So here's an example of two bacteria. They've already duplicated the chromosome and now they are forming a septation or a wall dividing the two new bacteria. They can go uh, fission um, every 10 to 20 minutes under ideal conditions, ideal temperature, pH, nutrients, so on and so forth. But it usually exhausts its food supplies as it does and accumulates waste. So they have this exponential growth rate until they use up all their um, nutrients and also expose themselves to their own waste. Bacteria can be classified in many different ways, but uh, most of them are less than two or three micrometers in diameter, so they're very small, smaller than uh, most other cells. And they occur primarily in three forms or three shapes. Cocci are round um, or spherical, bacilli are rod-shaped, and spirula are spiral-shaped. They can also be aggregated, so these are kind of clumped together, and these uh, are in strings. 
Um, and these are kind of singular, so there are different ways in which they will aggregate. They can also be classified by the presence of a sheath, or hair-like, or bud-like appendages, or endospores, or pili, or flagella. So here's a bacteria which is characterized by having multiple flagella. Um, or color, uh, specifically, um, which may occur after staining, so how they are affected by different stains. Um, how they move, their biochemical characteristics, their reactions to, um, to dyes, including there's a process called gram staining where it goes through two different stains and if there is um, a large amount of peptidoglycan they will stain this dark purple color. If there's very few they will stain this reddish color and you can then classify them into gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. Many bacteria are very useful. Not all of them will cause diseases. Some of them include biological control organisms. So Bacillus uh, thuringiensis will actually infect worms that destroy crops. And um, it does this by multiplying in the digestive tract and then paralyzing the gut so it can no longer um, eat or no longer move leaves through its gut and it gets really um, bloated and dies. Uh, Bacillus populae is another one. It's effective against Japanese beetle grubs. Okay, so it prevents the spread of Japanese beetles. Um, all right, now we're getting into the meat of the lecture. We'll talk about actual diseases. So common symptoms from bacterial infections include galls and overgrowths, wilts, leaf spots, specks, blights, soft rots, sca scabs, cankers, and slime layers. So this here, so a lot of times these bacteria will form these slimes, right? So here's some bacteria slime here. Here's some bacteria that has infected the xylem of this leaf forming this biofilm here. Um, and here are some spirilli bacteria found within the xylem of another plant cell. And these spots then here are on this lime are caused by bacteria as well. So bacterial bacteria um, for the most part can't move or disperse very far. So they were a lot of times rely on vectors. Um, one of the ways in which they spread is just through water, through rain, through streams, through pools. They can, they can move pretty well through water. Um, they may also go through water droplets um, as they pass through the sky. Also birds. So birds will go from many different plants and thus can help disperse those bacteria if it's on um, the feet or feathers or beak of a bird. Insects as well also will, will be hosts of bacteria that can infect many different areas. Humans, however, can also uh, be a vector by not cleaning down their tools. So if you are, you know, working in the garden, clipping a bunch of um, leaves and they are infected with a bacteria and then use those same clippers somewhere else, you can also spread those um, bacteria in other areas. So once you have a bacterial infection, it, they can be quite hard to treat. They, are, they aren't as common as other infections in crops, but they do sometimes occur. So some of the things you can do to, to treat them is a high concentration of copper compounds, antibiotics. Some of them have been developed, which cannot cure the, the plant that is infected, but it can reduce the spread of the infection to other leaves and plants. Um, sometimes you can use X, um, insects, so here's a wasp that will lay its eggs in this caterpillar. It can help then reduce the vectors of this disease if this caterpillar is in fact a vector. Uh, smart sanitation pro practices including washing your tools um, with bleach to kill all the bacteria. Um, crop rotation, so this can help to, if you have a diversity of crops, um, more than likely they won't all be um, infected or be able to infect all of the same bacteria. So if your corn has a bacterial infection, it probably won't spread to these other ones. But if you had all corn here, then all the bacteria could destroy all the corn. Um, and then, so a diversity of crops and then rotating those crops so that you aren't 
um, using the same crops, the same soil, and the same area every year. Um, that way if there's some bacteria in the soil, um, you're going to use different soil the next year, so that might also prevent the infection from continuing. Um, you can also prevent surface wounds of the plants to prevent bacteria from getting inside the internal structures and sometimes exposure to dry air, heat, and sunlight. The UV ray, the heat, the lack of water can help reduce bacteria infections on plants. Finally, I wanted to give you one example of a bacteria that causes an infection in plants. Agrobacterium, there are many different species. And we talked about this before, they are one that will insert their genes into the host plant. Okay, and after the infection, it causes this cancerous-like growth of galls. So here's a gall here, the depiction of one here. Um, <clears throat> and this can, of course, damage the plant and lead to its inability to move substances through the plant and can ultimately kill the plant. All right, that's it for...